This poem um, is called As Soon As You Leave and it's written in um, a form of, they're, they're called the 280s and they were a follow on from the 140s which were kindly published by Leaf Press. And this is 280 characters and it's called As Soon As You Leave. As soon as you leave, the bed is stripped. Morning routine becomes quieter. The grinding of coffee beans once more becomes a solo activity. 30-year-old compositions play in a different room. Outside, between pieces, a flap of wings and the rushed scamper for berries and grain. And the second 280, which I'm reading from the Lodine Chronicles, <coughs> excuse me, is called Refuel in Rouen. Refuel in Rouen, like J.D. Cahill travelling through the mountains, take the opportune moment to refresh. Gold thread from triple stitched denim falls to the ravine. As coffee grounds settle in enamel mugs, be careful not to stare too long. The road ahead is long with diversions. Thank you, that's lovely. Um, coffee, coffee seems to feature quite coffee a lot. Does seem to feature, it does yeah. indeed, actually. Yeah, <laughs> I haven't thought of that, but it does. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it, it really does. I mean, I think it's, it's part of the uh, writerly tradition. You know, yeah, I think the relationship so. with coffee, you know, it's the uh, stimulant of choice in certain quarters, you know. Yeah, that's why. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so when and how did you first know you were a writer? Well, aside from all the school stuff and, you know, the, the actual practicality of writing, the physicality of writing, I think it was when I was probably around 16 or 17, I was. I was asked to join a band and uh, as people in Liverpool did when you reach 16, it was a rite of passage um, and nobody would volunteer to write the lyrics, you know, and I was the oldest. So I thought, oh, somebody's got to do it. I'll do it then. So I kind of started scribbling all these ideas down in a notebook and then the, the singer would say, well, have you got any lyrics? And I'd say, well, I've got this. And he'd come up with the melody and, we kind of work on the melody and the, the lyrics together. So that kind of became the real spare to thinking about what writing was actually about, really, aside from the, the practicalities of you know, school and exams and all of that. So it, it was, you know, writing lyrics for, uh, you know, a rock and roll band in Liverpool in the 80s. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting because that I'm going to ask question number six next um, because <laughs> that's all about sort of how writing is <clears throat> a lot of it is collaboration with other people mm. and other art forms sometimes and it's 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 not a just sit down and write stuff it's it's a pull in loads of stuff from everywhere um, and talk to people and get inspired by people so i wonder um how you engage with the writing community and and maybe how you're engaging with it now in these weird times that we're in yeah great question really i mean I, I'm, I'm totally with you i don't think writing is a solitary act i mean it is of course it's a solitary act but yeah we share our work i mean we're very mm. fortunate we we perform our work you know we um, <clears throat> excuse me you know, I send poems to fellow poets and ask advice. You know, I'll say, I'm not sure about this, this, this final line. And the Lodian Chronicles is a collaborative text. Oh, so right. we'd, be, we'd be riffing off each, each other. Nick, Nick would send me a poem. 
then I'd send him a poem in response. So there is that relationship as well. But yeah, I mean, I've worked with um, artists, I've, I've worked with other poets, and I, I'm a great believer in the whole notion of collaborating because it kind of gives you that permission to, to continue what you're doing, really. And, mm. and by that, I mean, you know, if you're unsure about something and somebody says, no, 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 it's great, you, you know, it's the best thing you've ever done. It's like, whew, I thought so, but I needed that kind of, you know, pat on the back or whatever it might be. So I, I totally agree. It isn't a solitary act. I mean, you know, we are we are communal creatures, us poets, actually, you know, when we think about yeah. it. And during these times, I, I have been sending when I have, I've had the time or the the, um, the impetus to write some poetry, because it's, it, as you say, it's very, very, it's a very strange time out there. Um, I've been sending ideas for poems and talking to other poets about ideas and things. I don't want to become too focused on the fact that we're living in extraordinary times. I, I, I want the poems to to be of themselves, if that makes mm. sense. Yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. want them to be COVID-19 poems necessarily. No, no, I think there's going to be a few of those out there. I think there will be. And I think that's, anything else. Yeah, and, and I think that's a great thing if that's what that's what you want to do and if it helps you. I mean, you know, we are, we are, we need all the help we can get really. And I think that that means generally as well as in rightly terms as well. Mm. So how much do you write for yourself as opposed to writing for other people? Do you know what I mean? You know, it's a yeah, I do, yeah. thing that's in my head here. No, I think it's a, you know, it's an interesting question because many years ago when I was a founder member of the Edge Hill University Poetry and Poetics Research Group, we'd write for each other. It was great. Mm. We had some of the best poets, in my opinion, in the UK reading your work, you know, and I was blinded by it. It was, it was an amazing experience. So I was writing for them. And I think that's continued on by kind of collaborating and sending ideas to, to other poets or certainly i think that the whole notion of writing it is comes from me and then it, you know it is that justification mm. and, uh, i particularly bend you know bend the elbow into people's ribs when um coming up with a pamphlet and need sequencing or uh, a collection needs mm. sequencing. you know i've just submitted my next collection to the publisher well in april and uh, i couldn't get the beginning right i didn't know how to start the the, the book you know at all um because it's in two designated parts and I just mm. didn't know what the first poem was. So I solicited the advice of many people I know and just said, what do you think? And in the end, it was quite easy. It was a really new poem that I ended up opening <laughs> the collection. So, but it took months to try to, to work. Yeah. Out. And I'm glad, I, I'm glad I sent it off before mm. this really kicked in because I would have just not let it go because, you know, mm. I don't have to focus on stuff too much as it is. You know, sometimes yeah. it's, it's just really interesting good to let things go you know see what comes back so having finished that what are you working on now um i'm um i've got two new pamphlets ready um but um i'm holding back a bit until the next collection comes out really and that's just given me the opportunity to let them settle uh, you know a while i think that's really important as writers that we we allow things to settle um but i've been working on um what i predict will probably be another pamphlet um uh, i've been writing about nightingales strangely um, okay a, a long sequence about nightingales um because we had a visit last year in france last um easter of a nightingale who who kind of landed and we found the nest when we were doing some gardening and stuff and we left it in place uh, i was there for its arrival but i wasn't there for when it left it left on the 16th of june so a year ago tomorrow it would have left um so i've been thinking about the whole notion of not being somewhere when something is possibly happening and so the, the nightingale is a, is a representation of that and i suppose it's tied in with the covid19 thing because you can't go there you've got to stay mm. here and whether and of course one thing that this um pandemic has taught us is that the natural world doesn't stop it just carries on doing its thing so I'm hoping that the, the nightingale is actually still in our garden in France, even though we're not there. So I've been thinking about, you know, that whole relationship between humankind and, and the animal world, really. So which is a very, very strange thing for me to do. 
Yeah, it's one of those things that surprised us all, I think, the way the relationship has changed so much in just a couple of months. Yeah, um, strange, strange. So how has all this COVID-19 lockdown plague stuff affected your writing life? Um, <clears throat> I found it harder to write than ever, to be honest. Um, I think that's partly because everything seems to be taken an age to do and that's like my university work everything seems to be taking an age we're all on screens all the time and the last thing you want to do when you've spent a day in front of a screen and you're completely exhausted is get your notebook out because you can barely focus so i think it's had a physical and mental um you know influence on whether i write or not but i also think the subject matter i'm, I'm not going out in the world we're, you know we've been locked down well yeah. Those who have stayed in in and followed the rules of being locked down. One thing I have been doing is going for a daily walk around where I live, and a few ideas have come from that. You know, children have been chalking messages on the the, the pavement and things. So a couple of things have fed into a few poems. But it's I found it difficult to be honest. I mm. found it difficult to write, and uh, you know, I had that burst originally with writing the poems for the Nightingale sequence, and then that that stopped then when I. I kind of dealt with that and the fact that I wasn't seeing its arrival at Easter, you know, so that, that's kind of gone to one side and I'm, I'm just tinkering with things at the moment and um, I'm hoping that something will, will stick when maybe I can take some holiday and have, have, have a break and, and just let the writing come more naturally rather than forcing it, to be honest. Yeah, you said, um, I can't remember how you started that answer, but it kind of implied that you always find writing quite hard. Is that the case, do you think? No, I think I think I write a lot. Um, and I'm always usually sitting watching the TV and I've got the notes app open on my phone and I'm writing bits of dialogue down or ideas down. Mm. That seems to have stopped. So there's not the material to kind of play with. And not all of this reaches you know, the page, as it were, you know, that sometimes they're just thrown straight away or there might be a line or something. But um, so usually I write a lot, but I've not been writing nearly as much as what, I, you know, I ordinarily do. So I'm putting that down to the situation that mm. we're in, to be honest. Yeah. Does it bother you? Do you miss it? I, feel, I, I do miss it. Yeah. Um, I always feel better when I, when I started something and I, I know it's fizzling away at the back there and I can mm. think, I'll come back to that. I've just been working on a poem the past couple of days and I've finished it and then I'm kind of thinking, oh, um, what do I do now? <laughs> you know, it's, it's so I need I need to get those ideas down or scribble down in my notebook and um see if if it's worth working mm. on. Uh, and this particular poem um was written about Paris, and I think that's because I know I'm not going to be going to Paris this year. I mean, I'm quite lucky because I can usually whiz up to Paris or down to Bordeaux. Mm. Uh, during the summer um and that won't be happening uh, this summer i won't be going near any big cities and things like that so i think it's it's looking at the relationship of wanting to go to a place and not being able to rather like wanting to mm. go visit the nightingale and the nightingale not being allowed so it's yeah. so it's it's concerned with it. i think it's it's about absences really it's about not being able to i've never been not able to go somewhere before you know so it's it's new so maybe that it's all it's all mixed up to it all mixed up yeah mixed, you know. so so you kind of have got some sort of surprising inspirations that you might not have expected from the situation yeah i think so i think so yeah walking around and i mean i went for a walk um last night just before the storm funnily enough and i had my headphones in and it was really quiet and quite dark stormy like and all of a sudden the birds kicked off like they all started and I thought blimey so I switched the music off and I did I have a certain walk and I do a lap so I thought I'll do a lap without the headphones in and then see how long and they were just all chatting away and stuff like that it was great there were no people around there were no cars and then on the second lap it just went really quiet and I thought, wow, that's the time to put the headphones in. So I put the <laughs> headphones in and then I just got home just as the thunder started. And then, of course, there'd be no nobody out or no no birds flying around or whatever. But, I mean, it's quite leafy where we are. And it's great, you know, when, when you hear birds song, it really kind of restores your faith in that things are 
semi-normal, if that makes sense. You know, things are mm-hmm. carrying on despite us not carrying on, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, so taking inspiration from things like that, you know, I'll jot an idea down when I come back or I'll write down, you know, I saw a, a white-throated sparrow last night, which I hadn't seen before, so I wrote that down. And what that will manifest into, I don't quite know yet. Possibly yeah. not. Oh, the name of that bird, rather. Huh? The name of the bird's quite interesting, isn't it? White throat yeah, sparrow. It kind of conjures yeah. up all sorts of stuff. Yeah, it's only a flash. I, I noticed it, and I kind of looked it up when I got home in the book, and it's just like a flash across its throat, really. And I thought, wow. I thought it looks. I thought at first it was a robin. My eyesight's not not getting any better. Like it's getting much worse. And I was thinking, oh, that's the size of a robin, and I could see it was a sparrow, but then. Mm. When it flew off, I saw this white flash on it. So I thought, oh, never seen one of those before around here. Wow. Um, so, you know, jot, jotted that down. So who knows, who knows? So I think it's those things, those kind mm. of notes and scribbles on bits of paper or on your phone or on, you, know, you record a line into your phone or whatever. You come back to them with that little bit of time and, and it, it could turn into a poem. It could turn into a line in a poem or mm. it could just stay there and never be looked at again. Yeah, it all kind of mixes up in the end, though, doesn't it? And all turns into something, whether or not you use it. I think that's what us writers do. You know, we we kind of pull stuff in, and then hopefully something will come out at the other end. You know, you know, it'll yeah. be like some kind of poem that you're happy with, and it goes back to what you were saying about who who you're writing for. Like, if I'm happy with something, I really hope somebody else is going to be happy with yeah. it. You know? So it works like that, really. I mean, it's ultimately you've got to be content with it for somebody else to possibly even entertain the idea that they could be content with. Mm, yeah, I haven't thought about that. You know, yeah. if, if something's a bit unfinished or you're not unsure about it, I don't show it to anybody because if I'm unsure, then a reader's probably going to be unsure as well, really. So that- yeah. So, okay, who inspires you? And this could be writers or anyone who just, who sort of, this is people rather than birds. <laughs> it could be better. I should just say nightingales, shouldn't I, really, <laughs> at the moment? <laughs> um, oh, there's, there's, there's a lot of writers. I mean, you know, um, going back through the years, uh, there's, been, there's been so many writers who have admired their work, you know, and I'm just looking at the bookshelf here now, you know, I can go back to Adrian Henry, who was the first poet who really turned the light on for me about what poetry can be. I mean, up until that mo- up until that moment, I was taught poetry at school, which was terrible. It was did say go and um, ironically go and learn um, to recite "Ode to a Nightingale," and and you weren't taking notice of the poetry; you were just learning something, and mm. it was so. And I thought, this is nonsense. This is you know. But then Henry came along and he was writing about Liverpool. He was writing about where the streets where I was walking. And it's just, wow, this can, this is poetry. This is amazing. You know, so he was, he was the real catalyst. I mean, I was quite young, I guess it was before I was writing lyrics. So he was the real catalyst. And then throughout the years, I mean, Tom Rayworth, Charles Bukowski, uh, the beat poets, Kerouac, who I think is a much finer poet than he is novelist, which mm-hmm. isn't very trendy to say. Tom Picard. I've recently come across a poet called Robert Lax, um, who I really like. R.F. Langley, Denise Riley, um, you know, and more con- some contemporary poets like John James, who sadly passed away recently. He's a poet who I can go back to time and time again and see different things. And I think that they're, they're the kind of poets who really speak to me, Um, Mm, you know, Denise Riley's another poet who does that for me, you know, and and Geraldine Monk, you know, the mental poets who are pushing the boundaries about what poetry can be. I think that's, I'm always receptive to playing with form and what a poem can be. It can be a construct, it can be a visual piece, it can be a sound piece, it can be, you know, a piece, uh, you know, scattered all over the page or it can be something formal I think they're all perfectly valid so those kind of poets who kind of push me in in different directions I think I always return to really mm, yeah you know it's, 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 it's an easy there's there's loads of them there's just so many you know I, I, I was just thinking you know the other day about who I haven't read for a while and I keep thinking oh 
I must go back to Ted Berrigan or I must go back to, you know, Kerouac or whoever, you know, because there's so much contemporary stuff that's around as well, you know, yeah. which you don't build that relationship up because you, it's current, you know, so mm. you can't still progressing through it, if you like, whereas yeah. there's not going to be any more Kerouac poems. There's not going to be any more uh, uh, Bukowski poems. They're, they're, they're finished, you know, they're done. Mm. So Tom, even Tom, who died a few years ago, Tom Rayworth, I mean, there's one more book coming out of the stuff that was left behind when he died, you know, and that's it then. What, you know, where do we go? It's like the new people start to replace, I think. I think that's yeah. how it works. You know, you, you build up new relationship with, with contemporary poets. Helen Tucky, for example, you know. Oh, she's brilliant. Helen's great. You know, yeah. I mean, I, I do I do know Helen um, quite well from having taught at university with her, and and her writing always intrigues me because it just takes you off in so many different ways. So, you know, I'll I'll, I'll pick one of Helen's books up off the off the shelf and I'll just start reading it, and it it just gives you these ideas about what people are doing. I think as much as anything else. Mm. Yeah. So, so that 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 that's kind of a very long-winded answer to a very simplistic question, but a very important question because where does it start and where, where are we now? I think you know. It, yeah, and where's it going to some extent as well? I find that you kind of it, it it's almost a trajectory, and you have to keep reading the modern stuff, and the next modern stuff, and the next modern stuff to see what's absolutely. happening next and where absolutely. particular poets are going next and. It's, it's sort of difficult to find the time to go back and reread things, let alone read the, you know, all I the mean, stuff that was before my time. <laughs> sure, like I've, ne I've never, never read Wordsworth. I've never read any of the classics. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's so true, isn't it? I mean, I, I equate it to music. I used to, I used to listen to John Peel religiously of an evening, you know, ten till midnight, and mm. uh, you know, you'd be scared to not hear. An episode of his show because you'd be missing out on all this great new music and then I suddenly realized I'm never gonna listen I'm, I'm, there's so much stuff I'm missing out on and well it's the same with poetry you know so if if you you contacted me and said here's a poet who I think you'll really like I really pay attention <laughs> you know because yeah. I'm thinking I might have missed this you know and yeah. I, I might really get along with it or I might not you know but at least it's something new that's come my way I think and it, it's so important important to as you say to to read what's coming along now and what's going to be possibly the future classics if you like you know so i think i think that's that's really important to, as writers we, we we've got to read contemporary stuff we've got to see where where it's at and what people are doing you know it really is important but equally we have got to go back to wordsworth and and these people you know as well because without those guys these poets where would we be now you know it's really? so bizarre you know there's such a long trajectory i think yeah you know but time yeah. is of the essence isn't it you know and when are we going to get time to do it all you know it's it's uh exactly. that's one thing that lockdowns enabled me to do read more fiction you know which has been mm. quite nice you know quite nice too because i ordinarily don't I only read fiction for work really or fiction that i, I have to read um so I, i've caught up with a bit of my fiction reading as well so what sort of things do you like to read well i've just read um uh, telephone by Percival, Percival Everett, um, which is a, who's an American writer on the recommendation of a, of a friend of mine. And that's kind of contemporary. Um, it's quite a short novel with three strands all kind of doing things. And, that, and I tend to like realist fiction, I think. Um, I, or I, I do like crime fiction as well. I, I was a big fan many years ago, the Morse novels, for example, and things like yeah, that. Yeah. I do love to get into that world because they're so well written, so well written. Yeah. You know, and they're ticking all those boxes of what a crime novel should be doing. And, uh, you know, and um, John Harvey's Resnick novels, uh, you know, I, I read. Oh, yeah. I read many years ago. Um, no, so it wasn't Resnick, was it? Was it Resnick? Yeah. I yeah. always get him mixed up with the Scottish guy. Who's the Scottish uh, guy? Rebus. Rebus and Resnick, Ian, yeah. Ian so, Rankin wrote about... That's the yeah, one. Yeah. I, but, but both of them, I read both of them when I was younger mm. and really loved that kind of... You feel really as close to these characters because they're so well written. And I think yeah. that's such a skill, so hard to do, write a, a, a character where you can feel some sort of empathy or you build a relationship up with them. And, and, and John and, and Ian Rankin, they just, they, they, they're just 
they're just brilliant at it, you know. So I like that kind of stuff as well. But I mean, I recently reread uh, Francois Sagan's debut novel, Bonjour Tristesse. Um, and so contemporary ish. Mm, yeah. I think. But a bit of crime as well. I, uh, not a, that big a fan of horror, but crime um, I can cope with. It's a different way of reading, isn't it? It's not reading to engage with intellectually, it's reading to just go into another world and. That's it, exactly. Um, that's it. A perfect uh, way of putting it. And you do immerse yourself. And I, I love being so involved with a text that you can't put it down. Or, yeah. or you, you're boiling the kettle and you're picking it up and you're reading a page. Yeah. Or, you know, that, that to me is quality writing. It, it, it doesn't matter what the genre is. It's, it's quality writing that you're in that world and you want to know where your place in that world is and where the character's place in the world is. Yeah. And so, and so, so that's what lockdowns afforded me uh, that time really to, to to read a bit more fiction which is great great mm, that's good mm. um what are you most proud of in your writing career um i think just being published uh, many years ago when i had my debut pamphlet published was a real um humbling moment to be honest that somebody wanted to put my ideas, poems, whatever they were at the time, in between two covers and publish it. You know, mm -hmm. I was really humbled. And, you know, um, and more recently to have my, well, more recently, 2013, my debut collection came out because I was, I'm such a big fan of the pamphlet. I, I was really fortunate to be publishing a lot of pamphlets. And then somebody said, why don't you, gather what you've had in pamphlets and put them all into a collection now now's the time you know you've been publishing for over 10 years now and I hadn't really given it any thought so I think I'm constantly surprised I'm constantly humbled that people pay an interest and that's both from the readers and the editors of these uh, presses who say have you got something you, you you know are you working on anything can I look at something and it's like uh, wow you know I mean, my, my pamphlet, Air, which I launched at Five Leaves, was published by Red Ceilings a couple of years ago. And I happened to publish, to, to be launching three pamphlets in one night at Five Leaves, because <laughs> it, all, it all just came together. And I, I remember saying at the time, and thinking, this is madness, you know, and, and how lucky I am that people want, or they like my stuff enough to want to publish it. And I'll never get over that. And I think every time something comes out, I feel as if it's my, you know, it's the proudest moment is that the, the, the new books come out and you know I, I'll always be grateful because you know people are paying an interest and you know and, and it, the same with five leaves stocking our books and things you know it, it's it's so humbling to go into a bookshop and see your book on the shelf and that somebody believes in you enough to sit, to try and sell it to people you know yeah. so it, it's a, it's a real it really is humbling I think that's that's what it is so I don't know whether it's it's not pride. I'm I'm proud to be a published writer, but I'm more humbled, to be honest, mm. by the by the interest that people um, pay in your work. You know, the the, the 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 attention they give it, really. Yeah. Well, you've certainly got something to be proud of. Because thanks. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I'm not going to start saying how good your poetry is, because <laughs> then, then you'll start blushing, and I'll start blushing, yeah. and that's that's no good. That's no good. Um, <laughs> Okay, so last question is, what do you hope to achieve in the future? More of the same, I think, Pippa, to be honest, yeah. more of that. Yeah, more, more, more books when people see something that they like enough to publish. Um, just, um, you know, carry on writing, carry on publishing books and uh, doing, doing readings. And, you know, when people are kind enough to invite you to read somewhere, go along and try and um give you know give a good performance of your work it's not always easy with some of my stuff because it's quite uh sometimes doesn't transpose well from the page to the to the live mm. arena sometimes so i have to be quite careful really but um yeah just more of the same really i think i'd be very happy to launch my next book which is hopefully going to be out next year all, all being well um, uh if things uh getting back to normal and printers are working and things you know all, all that um so yeah just more of the same really just 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 keep just keep on doing what i'm doing and hopefully people will keep paying interest in it really uh, i've got a, you know a few things 
pipelines in, in the uh, things in the pipeline. I'm working on a collective poems of Peter Finch, the uh, Anglo-Welsh poet. Okay. Uh, and so I'm gathering his collective poems at the moment and working with him on that, which is quite exciting. But that's kind of a separate strand, so they they, they kind of feed into each other. So uh, when that's a kind of work thing, and this is a kind of other work thing. Mm. Poetry, so they they they're not exclusive; they do speak to each other. So I just keep on doing what I'm doing. I think. And presumably the teaching kind of comes into it as well. That sort of all, fe all feeds into each other. It, it really does. Uh, I mean, I know it's a big cliche that educators say that they learn from their students, but I really do. I mean, I've been very fortunate to uh, be working with a great bunch of students this year. And when lockdown happens, we were finishing, we were working towards their writing portfolios and, uh, you know, they was they were so accommodating when we were all teaching online and working online together. They they were so great, and they taught me how to work Microsoft Teams, for example. So, you know, this Luddite here, you know, without them, I'd be I'd have been up the up the shoot, you know. Um, but but yeah, I do learn from students because they have great ideas. Of course, they have great ideas because they're writers. You know, we're yeah. a strong community of writers, and so I learn from them. I, I'd never thought of doing that, or or they might even come to me and say. Oh, have you read such a body? And I'll say, well, no, I haven't. Oh, I think you'll like him. You know, it's that whole word, word of mm. mouth thing. Yeah. Students are, they're a great provider of material as well. So I do learn from students as well. You know, so it's the, the two things, the three strands, the critical work, the, the creative work, and, and being an educator and working with some very talented undergraduates, uh, MA students and PhD students is... Uh, really inspiring at times really really is mm. yeah so it is all about community i mean it's kind of back to the beginning again being a writer is something you do on your own but you don't do it in isolation by any stretch of the imagination do you absolutely absolutely you know going to readings you know we are fortunate with five leaves it's a it's a social hub people go to readings and we see each other it's like all oh, right you know we don't get a chance to say hello, anything but hello but it's that sense it is a sense of community here which mm. i was really really uh taken aback uh by when i moved over from liverpool you know this 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 whole yeah you know, we were talking earlier about it you know I came over here and there were, there were events on every night. I was thinking, wow, you know, and then it, it's just, it is about community. So all of those strands do feed in um, and it'd be, it'd be cherished to say that they don't, as they do. Mm. And Nottingham is very, very good at uh, supporting its own writers, you know, and, and other writers who yeah. come to the city, you know, and, and visit and stuff, you know. So I feel very fortunate to be living and working in a, in a very accommodating place. Well, he says, working, stuck in his workroom and not being out for ages, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Packing his face to go to France, yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> you know, but it, it's true, yeah, they all, they all, yeah. they all they, the solitary act is here and mm. then onto the page and then who knows where it goes from there. Yeah. Okay, thank you ever so much. That's been really interesting and yeah. I, I, I certainly want to carry on talking to you about an awful lot of the points that were raised, but uh, yeah. a bit time limited. So um, sure, sure. do you want to finish with a poem? Yeah, sure. Yeah, thanks. Um, I've got um, something that I, I actually read. I'll have to put my glasses on for this, I think. Uh, oh, no, maybe not. Um, I read at um, Five Leaves, actually, um, before the book came out. Um, and it's called In Praise of Codeine. And it's after Thomas A. Clarke. Any early morning between June and September, the steps to the bathroom seemed to take less effort. Crispness of the folded and sticker sealed pharmacy bag is reminiscent of Christmas morning. The name codeine stems from the ancient Greek kodea, meaning poppy head. Codeine was an American band formed in 1989 in New York and later based in Chicago. They released two albums, Frigid Stars LP, 1990 and the white birch 1994 there are things we will never dream about without coding one of the greatest blessings is when pain diminishes by the taking of medication on coding watching the change of seasons from a first floor window offers a unique experience 
codeine is the most commonly taken opiate. In the age of the quick remedy, it is refreshing to appreciate a tried and tested analgesic. It pays to consider the haze of the external and internal worlds. Formed from nature, ingredients enter D95, a factory outside Nottingham, to exit in blister packs. To be completely relaxed is a good thing. There is no difference between mild and moderate pain. Pain is pain. The pace of the afternoon can be measured in 90 plus minutes. If a tournament is taking place, so much the better. Everything that we watch is equally important or unimportant. There is no such thing as loneliness with codeine. The teardrop explodes B-sides from the early 1980s sound spectacularly alive on codeine. Losing the ability to walk long distances is made more bearable with codeine. 60 days seems at times to turn to 120 days. The mirror can be an endless source of entertainment. Daytime TV offers welcome respite when watching having taken 60 milligrams. As an alternative to alcohol taken before a flight, codeine offers calming entertainment when above the clouds. At the height of a heat wave, codeine can cool you down. A preference towards sleep is not to be considered a negative thing. Codeine consumption is not to be considered romantic, but a necessity when in pain with added benefits. The slow onset of calm is particularly reassuring. A robin's song over the hum of traffic is more potent when on codeine. On codeine, cosmiche music with its ambient modes and a motoric beat can allow for deep concentration when reading or staring out of the window. Certain kinds of memory can quickly come into focus, though at times it can feel as though you are floating. Is there anything more comforting than the green cross sign of the pharmacy? Thank you.